Welcome everybody to our first seminar of this semester. We have two series of uh, seminars, uh, expeditions, where we highlight the AI research that we do at Northeastern University and the distinguished lecturers that are uh, external speakers and that usually is done at the last Wednesday of every month. Today, we have uh, Peter Schindler talking about how AI is revolutionizing the discovery of materials. He's an assistant professor at the Department of Mechanical and Industrial Engineering of our university, where he's leading the Data-Driven Renewables Research Club. So he will talk about 45 minutes, and then we will have questions. Please input your questions in the Q&A. So thank you, Peter, for presenting to us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ricardo, for the kind introduction. It's been a, a real honor and pleasure to be part of your prestigious seminar and welcome you all to my talk. So let's jump right in. Uh, so for over 2 million years, uh, humankind has continuously searched for new materials to enable new technology. Just think about it. In the Stone Age, uh, you only had stone and wood uh, for your tools and for your weapons. And then around 2000 BC, the first metal was discovered, which is copper. And that, of course, completely changed society at that time. And that's why we classify this human evolution over, over, over centuries and, and millions of years in those ages. Uh, starting with the Stone Age, going to the Bronze Age, and, and after that, the Iron Age. And of course, more recently, uh, we can probably all remember, now we're entering the Silicon Age. So we have discovered semiconducting materials, and we have invented the first transistor. And of course, that first transistor gave rise to the computational revolution. So now we have all computers. And in fact, now we have also smartphones that are way more powerful than anything that came before it. Of course, every technology has also its downsides. So now we're all glued to our smartphone as it's depicted in this evolution here or devolution. And maybe AI is overtaking the world in an evil sense, but hopefully not. But uh, jokes aside, uh, the stakes are actually pretty high. So if, if you think of uh, the National Academy of Engineering has posted these 14 grand challenges for humanity. And those are challenges that are fundamental. So we have to solve them within the 21st century for humanity to thrive. And that includes just basic things as providing access to clean water or making renewable energy economical. And I would argue about half of those 14 grand challenges rely on the fact that we need to discover new groundbreaking materials or of some form involved in, in the solution to these problems is a materials problem embedded. And so, so you might now ask me, so how have we discovered materials so far? And so there's really two main strategies, if you can call them a strategy. One is by sheer luck or just by coincidence, you discover new materials. And there's actually quite a lot of examples for that, more than you would think, including uh, rubber tires and Teflon, Play-Doh, stainless steel even. And uh, the, sac the saccharin, the, the sweetener molecule, is actually an example I got from Taylor Sparks, Professor Taylor Sparks' TED Talk. He, he explained that a uh, long time ago, uh, a chemist was basically on his lunch break and he, he, he noticed that his fingers tasted sweet after working on chemistries. Uh, so he hasn't properly washed his hands. So he found that, oh, there's some sweet compound. And he went back to the lab and uh, licked all beakers and, and, and test tubes. I would highly recommend to not do that, this nowadays. If you're a chemist, don't lick beakers. But that was a pure coincidence how, how he found out that there is such a molecule that tastes sweet without being actually uh, sugar. And, and then of course, the second main, what you call more an approach is called an Edisonian approach or trial and error. And so from Edison, you know, he actually didn't invent the light bulb, but he made it economical by finding a new plant material that lasts for a very long time. And so he did a one by one trial and error test one material after the other, 6,000 different plant materials until he finally converged on finding his final filament for that bulb. So of course, as you might think, 
for the future, that not, might not be amazing strategies to just rely on on luck or try spend a lot a lot of time on on trial and error. There must be something better. Um, and so, so I have a question for the audience now. So this is a little bit of an interactive uh, section. So on your on your newly discovered smartphone, uh, please put in your browser polev.com slash Peter Schindler or scan this QR code. And the question for you is, of all solid state materials, so crystal structures in that sense, that we know of today, how many were discovered in the last 10 years? And so I gave you a, a few uh, options and I will check on my, also on my tablet, what you guys uh, all say. Let's see. So you can also just mentally, of course, cast your vote. Um, So you can think about it a little bit more um, and you don't you don't have to go to the vote but think about what of these options i think resonates the most with you is it one percent is it ten percent or is it up to 99 percent of all the materials we know today are discovered only in the last 10 years so i'll tell you the answer um so if you if you now look at all the number of materials in one of the largest crystal structure database, it's called the ICSD database, uh, as a function of the decade. So I'm, I'm going over the decades and when they were added to that database. So when were these materials discovered? And uh, it turns out it's about a third of all materials we know today are were discovered between 2010 and 2020. Uh, so so. You can think that's a lot or that's not a lot. It's kind of relative. So if you do, however, plot this now, uh, the, the left plot is the same, but in logarithmic scale, um, you can see that if you fit a, a linear uh, slope to that logarithmic curve, then the doubling time is about every 22 years, meaning every 22 years, we know double the amount of materials than we knew before. But if you compare that now to the rise in computing power, over the years, you can see similar to Moore's law, if you if you look at the high performance computers, how strong they are, they, that that power in performance doubles every 1.3 years, so much more rapidly than we can discover new materials. And so that kind of classifies science or the paradigms of science into four main paradigms, start, starting with the empirical sciences, where early humans kind of did experimental evidence and and, and found kind of uh, correlations and knowledge through experiments. And then later on, of course, like in physics and philosophy and chemistry, people developed models about the world. So to predict, so basically like Newton's laws or the planetary motion. So you understand kind of the physics behind of things and therefore can predict what will happen and you have a better understanding of the world. But due to that rapid rise in performance of those computing uh, approaches, the third paradigm kicked in that, that we'll, we'll tag as computational science. And I'll talk a bit about this more on the next slide. And then after that, because now we generate so much data using those computational and also experimental methods, we're entering now the fourth paradigm of science, which we also call data-driven science. So let's talk a little bit about the third paradigm. Uh, it's kind of focused on computational discovery. That, that is what actually my group at Northeastern focuses on. So we use a technique called density functional theory. Um, you don't need to know the details of what this is doing, but basically it is solving a simplified Schrodinger equation. If you, you probably heard this one from quantum mechanics. So you solve the electronic structure of a material. And these kind of techniques we call ab initio. So it's a Latin word that, that stands for from the ground up. So without any experimental assumptions. So this is really fundamental in the sense if we solve it, we can, we can make fundamental prediction about properties of materials. And I, I show you here kind of the main classes of mat material properties that we can predict. 
So there's of course structural like lattice constants and 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 and, and symmetry of, of a material, mechanical properties, then also of course optical and electrical properties of materials, then surface properties, which I personally focus on, and I'll talk a bit uh, more about these surface properties later on. And then there's also magnetic and thermodynamic properties. So it's it's a vast range of materials that you can purely predict using computational methods. Of course, some of these properties are more, more uh, 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 reliable in terms of the, the prediction accuracy, and some are due to uh, physical constraints of how we simplified those equations are not as good in predicting the properties. Um, but so, so to, to give you a sense of how this compares in, in terms of the time effort uh, of experiments versus those first principles calculations that I just mentioned. So of course, synthesizing a material or doing experiments to synthesize a, a new material can take weeks to a month or even sometimes to an entire PhD to synthesize a single material. Uh, and first principles calculations, on the other hand, usually depending on the properties takes between hours and days. And for certain um, more difficult properties, it can also take weeks on a, on a high performance computer. And actually here at Northeastern, we have our own a huge cluster. It's called the Discovery Cluster, which is hosted a little outside of Boston at the MGH PCC. So those has more than 20,000 CPU cores and over 200 GPUs. So this is all, all available to Northeastern faculty and, and also students if they do projects. And so we, we have access to those resources to do those first principles calculation. But even though uh, now these first principles calculations are much, much faster than synthesizing a material, uh, it's still too long, especially for properties that take weeks to compute, uh, to screen through a database of, let's say, more than 100,000 candidates. Because at this time, it, unless you have a very, very large cluster and you can run 100,000 materials in parallel, this also takes too long to screen through a, a vast array of chemical space and structural space. And so that, that, that justifies, in a sense, that move to the fourth paradigm within material science, which is the data-driven discovery. And we'll talk about this in detail. Basically, what we're trying to find in the data-driven discovery is uh, from previous knowledge and from previous data, so stored in some database, we want to now quantify the structure, structure property relationship. And the structure is, in this case, uh, a crystal structure. And the property can be any, any number of, of uh, material properties. And by creating this structure property relationship, we're trying to get uh, establish a surrogate machine learning model. And that's usually two parts. One is, uh, how do you represent that crystal structure? as a machine readable descriptor, sometimes called fingerprint or feature. And then after you have established some descriptor of, of materials, you can then feed that into a machine learning model and do hyperparameter optimization. Of course, nowadays, actually the learning model part is relatively straightforward because there's so many packages out there that can be just plug and play. So import scikit-learn or import uh, PyTorch, and you can do a lot of machine learning uh, given that you know how to featureize those crystal structures. And we'll talk about this in detail. So the main question, of course, students are always like, yay, let's go. I want to do a machine learning project. But uh, a lot of people are a bit disillusioned to, to see actually what comes way ahead of doing a machine learning project is you need good, high quality data. And so I will discuss now, uh, summarize what are, what, what are the sources of data within material science. Um, so let, let's have an overview. So what are the types of materials data that exists that we can use for machine learning? So the first thing is pure text. Um, so it, of course we have published for hundreds of years. So there's a lot of text, plain text and figures that describe scientific results within material science. So if, if you scavenge from the scientific literature, that falls under the natural language processing realm, or more recently, because the hype is so strong, large language models, of course. And I, I'm by no means an expert in, the, in this field. This is not my specific area of expertise, but I, I cited you here one paper uh, that basically discovered new thermoelectric materials given only past 
um, scientific literature on that subject. So by looking at text and what ha people have previously kind of uh, looked into in the literature, they could kind of fairly certainly predict what would be the next predicted thermoelectric material. And then there is experimental data, and I'll classify that in two sections. So there's experimental data uh, that is very com complicated, I would say. So I would say this is like spectra from, from spectroscopy or images for something like transmission electron microscopy or just regular microscopy or X-ray diffraction for the spectra. So these are where single data points is a, is a whole vast space of data itself. So a single data point, a single image, of course, contains a lot of information. And so does the spectra. And so I cited you two papers here. There's a lot of work on classifying basically TEM as transmission electron microscopy images and automatically correlate where the atomic structures are. And similarly with X-ray diffractions, there's efforts to automatically characterize the phase content of an X-ray diffraction pattern. Um, and then what I personally focus on, so most of, on most of this remaining talk will be focused on this aspect, is computational data. And computational data, I'll, I'll classify into two sections, big data and small data. And again, some small data I would categorize also in the experimental section, uh, which is just pure material properties. So if you, for example, in an experiment, you, you synthesize 100 materials and you measure some, uh, some property, then you have 100 data points of some material property. Of course, usually, although there's now efforts to uh, have high throughput automated experimentation, usually it's still quite difficult to get quote unquote, big data from experimental sources, because big data is tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points. And of course, it's difficult to, to perform 100,000 experiments on different things. Uh, and so for now, for the most part, I would say big data is purely within the material science domain is computational, of computational nature. And there's two kind of categories, how to classify this. One is more complicated, is atomistic simulations, meaning there's a trajectory of how atoms kind of equilibrate and, and that trajectory can be used as a training source of data. And then what I personally focus on is called high throughput computation. So I use high, put, uh, high throughput density functional theory to, uh, to calculate properties of a vast range of materials. Uh, one after the other, basically. And there is already existing, uh, that's only a few of the materials databases that are out there that are of computational nature and would fall, in my opinion, under the big data uh, realm, which is one of the most known one is the materials project uh, out of Berkeley. And that has, I think, around 100,000 materials. And then uh, also more recently, there's the Open Cat Cat Catalyst project uh, from CMU. Uh, that that one has actually millions of DFT calculations, so that is truly in the big data range because that that relates to surface properties, which we'll talk a bit more. And there's a lot of surfaces you can compute properties for, like absorption energies. And then there's also from NIST the Charvis DFT. And then lastly, I want to mention Optimate. So there's a kind of the, the community has agreed on an API standard on how to how to disseminate data to make it. Uh, accessible to the community, um, and so they have is uh, that that is quite useful in terms of how the the material science community comes together to agree on a standard on how to store data online for other people. So that is kind of the overview of the types of materials data that I see in in the general space. And again, for the most part, uh, I personally my research focus on the co computational high throughput side of things. Um, and so how does that now uh, translate to the different paradigms with, within machine learning? So in, in other areas of machine learning, if you listen to Andre Ng's uh, recent kind of statements, is that early on in the development of, mach of, of AI models, everything was very much focused on the model. So it was model-centric AI. So how can we change the model? How, we, how can we improve the architecture? And then as this has become very mature, so again, I mentioned that you can import many machine learning models very easily, import SkyKidLearn, import PyTorch. 
So things have kind of moved more to a data-centric AI approach where we really look closely at the quality of the data uh, and we move kind of from the big data range to quote unquote, the good data. Uh, and, and, and of course that's a little bit up for debate, but actually at the same time, of course, there's the opposite trend with the large language models where everything goes into just more data, more data, more data, just who has more data wins. So that those are kind of two different paradigms that kind of compete with one another. But I think this paradigm shift to moving to smaller good data is, is critical for companies and smaller companies that, that might not have resources to, to, access, to, to compute as, as, as big of a database by themselves. So I think the data centric guy definitely has its place, whereas other models, other strategies are to just crunch the numbers and just create bigger databases. And so in, in terms of what are the approaches then you can use, depending on which kind of data you have, I'm leaving out the language part of it for now because I don't know much about this field, but basically one approach which used to be very common and but is still used is called shallow machine learning plus feature engineering. So you, this is especially uh, useful for small data where you don't have a huge amount of data to train a deep uh, neural network. So you, you, you create a small set of maybe interpretable features and then do like a random forest model or linear regression uh, to fit your, your properties. And then there's active learning, which is especially interesting for experimental data as well, uh, especially if you uh, try to, if you have a, a, an area of possible uh, materials that you can synthesize, it tells you where to look next with the, and you can define that acquisition function with a Bayesian framework where it tells you, oh, this is the highest uncertainty compound that you should test, or this one is the closest to the current uh, global optimum. And so depending on if you wanna focus more on exploration or on exploitation, you can change that acquisition function. And that's especially useful if you have small data and you're trying to decide where to acquire your next data point, then active learning can be very useful and also to optimize uh, experimental uh, setups. And then lastly, of course, what's uh, much, much more popular these days is, is deep learning. And so I would argue deep learning, you really, uh, really need big data, although the recent kind of adv advancements in, in kind of architectures has, has pushed that data limit down. So you need less and less data to actually use those deep neural networks effectively. And I'll talk about this, these architectures a little bit in more detail. And then there's, of course, the other approach, transfer learning, where you do pre-train uh, a deep learning uh, kind of approach on a huge data set and then transfer over that model to a small data case. And so for the remaining of my talk, I will focus on three sections. First, I'll go a little bit more in detail on the materials descriptors that I just mentioned. Uh, and then in the second section, I'll talk about my own examples of research, research that I've used for data-driven discovery. And lastly, I'll, I'll end with an industrial perspective and kind of a summary of how I, I see the field moving. Uh, and so let's start, first of all, for especially for the non-material scientists and the non-chemists uh, in the audience. So, so what's actually the difference between a crystal structure and a molecule? In, in many ways, they're actually quite similar. So they both have atomic coordinates. So basically 3D coordinates where different atoms are placed in space. And then also some information of what type of atom it is. Is it a carbon atom? Is it a nitrogen atom? So the type of, of atom, but then so the main difference now between uh, crystal structures and molecules is that a crystal is, in, is infinite in periodicity. So they, in addition to this, it has three lattice vectors. So in three dimensions, it spans a unit cell and it basically it tells you how it in, in symmetric sense repeats infinitely in all three di directions. Unlike the molecule, which has no, no repetition, it's just a single object and surrounded by vacuum, if, if, if you will. And so while there's many like similarities with the coordinates and the atom types, of course this crystal structure is periodic and the molecule is not periodic. And so oftentimes on the right side for chemistry, you will be tagged as this chem informatics. So anything that uses computational methods or like machine learning to predict 
uh, molecule properties is called chem informatics, whereas everything in crystalline or surfaces is maybe called materials informatics. When in truth, there's a lot of overlap in terms of how to featureize those two structures. Uh, there's certainly distinctions and slight adaptations on how to featureize, but for the most part, there's actually a lot of commonality between chem informatics and materials informatics. And so, of course, one, one more thing I want to talk about is symmetry. So there's a bit of a difference in terms of what symmetry applies to a crystal and to a molecule. So uh, it, both is governed by groups. So it's group theory that kind of tells you how, how a molecule, a crystal is, is, is symmetric. In, in, for example, if you mirror the structure, does it look the same? If you rotate, rotate it 90 degrees, does it look the same? So for molecules, this is called point group symmetries. So it's, it's symmetries around a single point, whereas crystals also have translational symmetry because it's infinite in X, X, Y, and C. So those are called space group symmetries. But for both cases, what applies is a so-called E3 invariance. And so E3 is the Euclidean group in three dimensions. So basically that means translations and rotations in three-dimensional space. And of course, if you take a molecule and rotate it or translate it, it's still the same molecule. And that actually also applies to a crystal. So if you, if you rotate the crystal and, and shift it, um, maybe the unit cell looks different, but ultimately, it's, if, you, if, if you look at it globally, it is the same crystal. So both molecules and crystals are Euclidean uh, invariant in three dimensions. And so uh, that leads me to uh, what, what are the requirements for an ideal descriptor now, now that we know a little bit about um, li a little bit about materials and, and, and atoms and molecules. There's actually quite a few restrictions or requirements that we, we wish to have for, for an ideal materials descriptors. Not all of those are usually fulfilled, but I'll, I'll mention a few ones that are actually quite challenging. So again, it should be invariant under those symmetries that I just discussed. And also it should be invariant under those atomic permutations. So if you just label the atoms one, two, three, four, and then I change the labeling to this is the first atom and this is the second atom, of course, these two structures are the same and should map to the same point in feature space. And if I now apply, uh, for example, a rotation or permutation, again, that is the same object and therefore it should actually represent the same point in feature space. So that, that's a huge restriction on how we want to design materials descriptors because it, it, it needs to fulfill those constraints to map to the same point in feature space. Um, and uh, the other thing is we wish it ideally would be continuous, meaning if I change uh, a little bit one atomic position, the, the feature space location should not change drastically. So it should be kind of smooth, continuous on how we expect those features to change. Uh, there's a few, a few other constraints that I mentioned here, but I won't go into uh, that much detail. Uh, and there's actually, so I created this a, a few years ago, partially it's a little bit outdated, but it's still kind of true. There's this hierarchy of materials descriptors in terms of the resolution and the accuracy, starting from microscopic kind of atomic environments. So, so we look at really the bond angles and distances of atoms and, and put them in a matrix, for example, that's the Coulomb matrix. So those are kind of micro scale uh, descriptors. And then you have also in the in between that you have the mesoscale where you fragment for this is especially interesting for maybe like polymers or something where you have groups that stay the same you group together uh, one uh, functional group into a single thing like a single object and try to uh, create descriptors around those single uh, objects and then lastly this is kind of the very zoomed out version is the macroscopic kind of feature we look only at the chemical composition of the compound we, in, uh, and in that sense, you lose all information about actually the microstructure of that of, of that crystal. So you just uh, you look at titanium oxide, for example, t t titanium O2, and then try to featureize that chemical composition. And and that the, the trend generally is that these microscale uh, features are designed for kind of an automated deep neural network kind of approach where you do not select specific features but take the entire feature space and map it into a deep neural network. Whereas these mesoscale and macroscale approaches are usually require some sort of feature, feature selection 
after I created the initial features. And that can be either guided by physics or by intuition or uh, through some regularization or, or some iterative methods. And so for the remaining of the materials descriptor discussion, I want to focus actually on graph representations, which are the most uh, modern ones and the most uh, best performing ones these days. So I'll briefly discuss uh, those. So first, let's start, start with graph convolutional neural networks. Uh, and there's uh, two main types uh, that are most known, but there's actually many others. So there's a whole slew of graph convolutional neural networks. I'll start with the crystal graph convolutional neural network. So basically, you have this crystal structure. If you remember, I showed you um, uh, what, what the difference between a crystal structure and the molecule is. Uh, and so what you now transfer this crystal structure and represent it as a graph. And the way you do that is that nodes represent atom types. So for example, the yellow atom is this node. And then any bond between atoms is the edge in the graph. And once you do that representation, and, 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 and the cool thing about this is, you know, you remember there's periodic boundaries. So it, it, it's infinite actually in three dimensions that can be nicely solved by considering that this atom is connected to the other side uh, of the repetition of the other side. So you can nicely of crystal structures and actually molecules alike. That's the other beauty of, of graph convolutional neural networks. They work for both molecules and crystal structures. You can represent them as a graph and then put them in a convolutional neural network with a pooling layer at the end, and you train your weights according to an output property. And kind of the, um, the extension of that, the first extension of that is called a line, atomistic line graph neural ne network. We take this one layer above and also encode uh, encode the angles between three atoms. So you don't only encode the type of the atom and the distance of the atom, but also the, 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 the angle between three atoms. And the way you do that is that now the nodes are no longer atoms, they're actually bonds, and the edges become bond pairs. And this way you can encode more structural information in that graph convolutional neural network. And, and the great thing about this approach is that that's what I told you about this constraint. It's actually invariant to this Euclidean group. So this is this by creating the graph that is automatically invariant to those translational and rotational symmetries due to the fact that I'm only looking at bond distances and the bond distance does not change if you rotate this object or translate it. The bond distances stay the same, the angles stay the same. So this is automatically by design uh, invariant to the Euclidean group. Um, and so lastly, I want to mention kind of the state of the art network as it as it stands. This is the highest performing uh, deep neural network. And it's slightly different to the uh, invariant network that uses the crystal graph. And it's called the E3 equivariant graph neural network. And I'll explain here what equivariant means. Um, so, so let's assume now we have an input crystal structure and we featureize that structure. So the, this is just a depiction of this is the feature space representation of this input crystal structure. And then we put it in a neural network architecture and get a prediction of a property. For example, this is the energy of this structure. Um, okay, and now we apply one of these E3 symmetry operations. So for example, in this case, I translated this unit cell by a quarter of the unit cell vector in the diagonal. So uh, while it is the, still the same structure, it looks now completely different. It looks like the, the red atoms and the, the, the gray atoms are swapped, but they, actually, they, they are swapped in terms of the coordinates. So the coordinates look completely different to this structure, but due to the periodic boundaries, this is exactly the same crystal structure and it should map to the same energy. But of course now, because the coordinates have changed completely, the feature space representation also changed completely. And the prediction, if that is not in the test set or in the training set, is of course a different energy, which is not what we want, right? So an, an, an approach to kind of overcome that would be to just generate a bunch of input structures that have all sorts of translations and rotations and add them to the training set. Then the neural network can basically learn that those two things actually mean the same. 
So that all the burden is, is on the network to learn this symmetry in, in, the training, in, in the training set. Of course, this is not very good because this is very inefficient. You need a lot of extra data. So you need some data augmentation. It's also not physical because we, we hard code kind of learning this symmetry. Well, we already know there's a symmetry. Of course, I told you just in the previous slide, there's a better approach, which is called invariant uh, architectures. So in that sense, it's, it's shifted here. But of course, the graph representation during featureization, I just told you the graph itself is invariant to an E3 uh, symmetry operation. And therefore, the feature space looks exactly like the original structure, even though this is shifted or rotated. And therefore, because the feature space looks the same, the energy prediction, of course, stays the same as we want it to be. So no additional data is required to learn this symmetry because the featureization itself uh, uh, is sufficient to capture the symmetry. And now lastly, that, that's, an, that's the newest approach is called equivariance. Um, and so equivariance is interesting. So we do the same thing again. We apply an E3 translation to this unit cell so it looks different. Um, but now the, the represent, representation in the equivariant neural network is such that in the feature space, the feature points, uh, uh, translate accordingly. So if you translate the input structure, so as we have done here, the feature space, uh, it looks qualitatively the same, but it shifts in a certain direction. Or, or similarly, if you rotate the, uh, the input crystal structure, then the feature space uh, transforms accordingly and rotates in feature space. And so then the architecture network is also uh, designed in a way to learn about this kind of uh, behavior in the feature space and predicts the same energy at the pooling stage. So this seems like an extra step from the invariance, but actually it captures some deeper meaning in the feature space because the feature space itself behaves like the crystal structure symmetry. So translation in the, in the crystal structure correspond to translation in the feature space. And that is actually achieved through tensor products and, and geometric tensor bases. Um, and so as, as it turns out, if you look at experimental data, that even though it seems on the surface to be the same as the invariant approach, it actually improves transferability and data efficiency, meaning you need less data and to get the same performance. And transferability means new materials that you have not trained on are better predicted, even though they are out of distribution of the initial test set, a uh, training set. And so, to show you that uh, there is that that is uh, mostly developed by the Kusinski group uh, uh, under his first PhD student Simon Batzner, and and they have created two actually equivariant neural networks: is the NECWIP and the Allegro. So the NECWIP is a message passing equivariant neural network. And then in the second iteration, they improved the performance by making it purely local, uh, while uh, very, only a little bit of accuracy is lost over the NECWIP. So for all intents and purposes, uh, they, I, I've heard them saying you should always use Allegro because it's much uh, faster to use. And as you can see, if you, the, the NECWIP, even at 200 data points, this is the red curve, uh, is outperforming the dashed black line, which is FizzNet, is some other architecture that is not equivariant, uh, outperforms it at even a thousand or, or roughly a thousand data points. So as you can see, it's much more data efficient with getting the same low errors than another network that is not equivariant gets with much more data points. And so if you're a little bit interested in the details on the math, the tensor product I mentioned, uh, we actually have an in-house expert at the Cory College at Northeastern. So I, 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 I happily refer you to Professor Robin Walters, who joined actually exactly at the same time as, as myself a year ago. And so if, he, he is really knowledgeable on the mathematics and kind of the computer science aspects of these equivariance uh, setups. So please uh, shoot him an email if you're interested. Uh, so, so what can we use this equivariant neural networks for? That, that is kind of the interesting part now. So if you look at kind of different computational methods in material science, um, there's different uh, 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 scales of predictions. So there's actually uh, electronic uh, accuracy, what I just mentioned before, density functional theory, uh, where you have uh, 
electronic, you solve electronic properties like the Schrodinger equation to get the properties. Those are the most accurate ones. And then you move to higher orders, so different uh, tiers of simulation that then molecular dynamics only consider atomistic interactions. And then if you further uh, go up in, the, in that regime, there's coarse grained modeling. And then there's KMC and uh, finite element models, if you know, for mechanical engineering. And so that trade off between the time scales and length scales that are available as a function of how accurate they, uh, they are, they're restricted to that diagonal because of computational effort. So you cannot just run DFT on on thousands or or tens of thousands of atoms because that's too computationally expensive and that's where it, where the affordable accuracy term comes in so you know you use those neural networks to extend that accuracy range in time and in length scale and that enables new area of of development in in those in in those ranges where you before could not solve that system at that scale or at that at that time scale or length scale okay i'm actually uh and so as a last example from the from uh, simon batzner again uh he actually demonstrated that you can run allegro on a full hiv capsid uh uh of a capsid which has 44 million atoms at the at kind of quantum mechanical accuracy scale so this really uh, get this really enables a whole new range of of simulations that before were not uh, possible. And actually, I'm a little short on time, so I'll skip actually some of the experimental sections. Uh, but we were basically able using a data driven approach in uh, in that work uh, is also an archive. We were able to develop a high throughput density functional neural network, uh, high, high throughput density functional theory uh, approach to compute uh, tens of thousands of surface work functions. If you remember, the work function is how much energy is required to extract an electron from the surface. And we were able to screen through that vast database and use a machine learning model to find new uh, candidates that have an extremely low work function. And the extremely low work function is especially critical when it comes to a process called thermionic energy conversion, where you try to harvest the waste heat and convert wasted heat back into usable electricity. And then that second project, we developed a fully ab initio a photo emission uh, model. And in conjunction with that machine learning model of the work function, we screened through 75,000 semiconducting materials and discovered 11 new materials with an intrinsic emittance less than 0.3 micrometers per millimeter, so way beyond the, the state of the art, plus an additional three air stable low intrinsic emittance materials. And for that, I refer you to this advanced materials paper where the main author was uh, Evan Antoniak. He, he's now at Lawrence Livermore. So he's a, he's a, a great theorist that you can also check out uh, his papers. Uh, and then lastly, I'll end with a kind of an, a short industrial uh, perspective. So is it only for academia, materials informatics? And the answer is, is no. It's actually all the big players are entering the materials informatics, especially the automotive industry, realize that, oh, for battery materials and for some other materials problems, we need to have our in-house in, in materials informaticians to solve those problems and to guide our material selection. And of course, these, these, these companies have a lot of uh, resources in terms of compute power and also financially, so they can usually create the largest database out, databases you see in literature. And I'll give you a brief perspective. So before I joined uh, Northeastern, a year ago, I, I was a senior scientist at the startup Aionics. And they specifically focus on the kind of discovery of material, uh, materials for battery application in this pipeline where they generate structures and then run cloud-based DFT, which was one of my contributions to the company, and then uh, use the AI platform. And in the meantime, more than 10 billion, a list of 10 billion uh, candidate materials and molecules to choose from. And then more recently, I've talked to, to Austin Sendek, is, who is the CEO of that company. They are also able now to partner with another company to actually synthesize new formulations, up to 10 billion new formulations on the fly. 
And then if that's a successful candidate for, let's say, an electrolyte in a battery source at the production scale, so tons of material. And they work with, again, we worked with smaller companies and, uh, and also some bigger companies that didn't want to uh, have their in-house materials informatics all set up because that, of course, is very expensive. So they, they talked to Aonics and co-innovate uh, with them on new materials discoveries. And so to, to conclude my talk, um, do I see it as physics versus machine learning or materials science chemistry against machine learning? And the answer is no, I see it as two parts. One part is physics motivated, uh, physics informed machine learning. As, as I told you before, all these symmetries actually make our machine learning models much more powerful. So by knowing the physics and the symmetry of the problems, you can actually vastly increase the performance of machine learning. And then the other part I just mentioned also before is that machine learning uh, extension of the affordable accuracy gets us to uh, a realm that we were not able to compute ever before. So, and, and in that sense, that discovers new physics, new materials and new chemistry that was not accessible in the past. So I don't see it as physics versus machine learning. I see it as physics informed machine learning and machine learning informed physics. And so with, with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my team at Northeastern, the D2R2 group, and my previous group at Stanford, the Reed Group, and the late Professor Evan Reed, as well as Aonix and all my mentors and collaborators. And I would also especially like to thank uh, Professor Ricardo and Liz and the entire experiential AI team for kind of making this possible and, and organizing this seminar so well. Um, and so with that, I hand it over to Ricardo. Yeah, thank you, Peter. A fascinating talk uh, on, on these materials. I, I have learned a lot myself. And Liz will go over the questions now. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, so the first question is, the literature doubles every nine years. Does this mean materials are being discovered relatively slowly? Yeah, I think the answer, the short answer is yes. Yeah. Um, and, and also the literature doubling does not exactly uh, mean that the materials, the new materials are doubling, right? So definitely there is, uh, it comes back to what I said in the beginning that, you know, experimentation is much slower than computation. And so there's definitely a lag between how quickly experiments can move to confirm what we predict computationally. And uh, yeah, so, so the question is ultimately, and, and people are working on this, uh, how can we speed up high throughput experimentation as well? And there's, there's good work uh, in, in labs going on, but of course with high throughput experimentation, that takes a lot of more effort and money to actually pull off. Unlike computation, which if you have access to a high performance computer, you can iterate quite quickly. Whereas experiments, again, Hopefully it doesn't take an entire PhD anymore to discover a new material, but it at least takes some time, even with a high throughput experimentation. So definitely there's a lag in terms of how to confirm uh, new materials, but I think I'm optimistic that at least partially it will catch up at, at least a little bit to the computational speed. To complement your answer, Peter, I would say yeah. that all the research literature is doubling, but the important thing for me will be is the material research literally, literally doubling or not? I uh, think how many years? I don't think it will be nine years for yeah. the same reason you say, but maybe it's uh, closer to 22 years. So that will be interesting to know, but I don't know how fast the material research literally is going. Right, exactly. Yeah, good point. The second question is, can this AI scheme work for amorphous and or glassy materials? How much difficulty or complexity would that add to the AI? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So yeah, um, uh, the answer is, in in principle, uh, it is it is possible, but there is a little bit of a complication because, of course, amorphous materials are technically not are not periodic, so they are kind of more similar to a liquid so everything is randomized um so definitely there's more challenge but 
in principle, what you could do, for example, is you could have a large amorphous like crystal structure, meaning the unit cell is fairly large, which of course for quantum mechanical calculations makes it very expensive, but not necessarily uh, for machine learning methods. So that, that scales much more favorably. So if you use a graph neural network to simulate maybe the relaxation of an amorphous structure, you can perfectly do that, especially if you're training data uh, let's say if you run molecular dynamic simulations, if your training data comes from amorphous quenching or some amorphous processes, then of course, if you train your graph neural network on that, it learns kind of the behavior of amorphous structures. So the answer is a little bit, one approach is to make your unit cell large enough to, uh, to mimic uh, a glassy state, mm -hmm. which of course is not perfect because it still repeats at some point. But that probably gets you close enough to predict those amorphous properties. Okay. What are the most well-known examples of materials discovered by these methods in use in industry? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question because usually industry um, uh, does not directly share some of those details, of course, uh, especially recently. Um, I think the examples are probably best best visible, again, also in the battery uh, regime, where there's constantly need for new, let's say, electrolyte materials or cathode materials or even anode materials. So based on these chemistry, chemistries, I think, especially in the battery field, or, but, but in other fields as well of discovery, those methods have been really powerful in not only predicting new materials, but understanding certain behavior of existing materials at scale. Similar to what I told you before that, if you extend that range of prediction in, in, in what I show on the top right here, with machine learning potentials, you have access to scales that we did not have access before. And so to understand like a real scenario environment, let's say uh, electrolyte in contact with a cathode material, what happens, are they reacting, are they not reacting? That one we can much more better now mimic and, and, and understand what is happening. So yeah, th there's probably a lot of specific examples and some of those are not, uh, not visible maybe to everyone. It's just say, oh, we use a new uh, electrolyte material. Uh, and maybe they say roughly what the kind of, what is contained in that uh, in that material, but maybe companies are reluctant to, of course, share the details on that. Next up, thank you for the fantastic talk. How do you validate your framework or model given there are thousands of materials and you can do hundreds of thousands of experiments. Is there a way to decide the minimum number of experiments for validations? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Oh, thanks for the compliment. Also. Um, uh, yeah, so actually that comes a little bit, um, a little bit towards active learning and probably a point you towards active learning because I mentioned active learning is exactly designed in, in, in a way to point you to if you have a certain restriction on, okay, experimentation takes a long time, which it does usually. It's like, where should I look next? And then iteratively improve your model. So basically Bayesian frameworks, depending uh, on your acquisition function, you can either focus on exploration uh, or exploitation, meaning depending on which state of the cycle you are in your experimentation, you can either first prioritize exploration, meaning give me all the material data points where I should look, which there's most uncertainty in the machine learning model. And then once you converge to a, a reasonable landscape in your, in, in your space, you switch over to exploitation. So it's like, now I think I know the landscape pretty well. Now I wanna find the absolute global optimum. And so I think active learning is the way to go, especially for experimentation, how to decide what to do next. After materials discovery through computational predictions, what do you see as the major next steps? For example, are those materials and their properties then used in simulations of bulk materials? Or does focus then transfer to attempts to synthesize the material? Yeah, that's a great question actually as well. Um, well, let's see if I can predict the future. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, I think I think both things are still like rapidly evolving. So 
even the computational and the machine learning realm um, is, is rapidly still evolving. I told you these equivariant neural networks are kind of the state of the art, but even last week, I saw a new paper that basically gets very similar performance, but uh, at least for elemental crystals, uh, but with much less compute effort where you don't really, where the kind of the training is much cheaper to do. So I think, I, I think even for me personally, it's very difficult to even get a hold of literature because it's moving so fast. I, I don't know if the doubling time is actually accurate, but even within, even within kind of materials informatics, there's like, at least two papers a month, new ones, new discoveries, new architectures. So it's kind of a bit difficult to, to get an overview of the zoo. So that's what I tried also today to give you a nice overview of what is out there and what's kind of the current state of the art. But of course, maybe in, in half a year, this is already outdated. So I think there's definitely evolution in there. But I think the question I think we need to ask is, do we reach a point with computation <laughs> where it's so accurate that the experiment will only be an afterthought. And I'm not sure about the answer to this. If, if computation in some sense can partially re replace experimentation, it already does it to some extent because by machine learning guided exploration, we do less experiments, right? We only look, uh, I started with the Edisonian approach where you do one after the other. This is the opposite, right? I know I I'm like guided by previous data or previous knowledge to make the best next decision on where to look next. So by that means I already reduce a lot of experimentation by only focusing on the promising candidates. And I think that will, will continue to evolve that direction where, um, where the accuracy of that prediction becomes so good that you need to do less and less experiments. But I think at the end of the, at the very end of the day, experiments do needs to to kick in and to confirm right because atomistic simulations is always a model at the end of the day it's like all uh, there's this quote all models are wrong but some are useful and i think ai is exactly in that realm it's very useful in in terms of guiding our our, our uh, endeavor thank you what sorry that was a long answer <laughs> that's okay <laughs> Um, we have time for one or two more. What specific NLP tasks are the most useful in analyzing the literature? Summary. I have no idea. I have no idea. No uh, idea. NLP. Okay. And, uh, no idea. I, 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 told, I told in the beginning, text, I just for the sake of completeness, that is the amount of data we have in text, experimental and computational. I, I, I do no research in NLP or LLMs, so I cannot comment on that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm um, trying to see. Oh my gosh, there's so many. These are <laughs> oh, glad. glad that has that. been very exciting. Yeah. Um, all right, Ricardo, will you read the last question? Yes. So uh, I think I will choose the this one. Can a research for a new material discovery be done with computation and experiment both along? What was the last part? So can you do uh, a discovery of new material doing both computations and experiments at the same time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we kind of discussed this in the in the previous question a bit. But yes, so basically computation, again, guides you uh, where to look next experimentally. Uh, of course, this, that comes back to the active learning again. If you have an autonomous high throughput experimentation, the machine learning is exactly what iterates. So it, it so you could uh, pick, yeah. So you could combine in a sense. So you pick, so you first run an hour, a, a bigger loop of computational uh, predictions, and the computational prediction tells you look at this material, and then you actually measure it, and the measurement result goes back into weighting uh, the computational model. So in that sense that there could be an entire loop of, of also putting experiment mm. into the model. Although I will say that mixing computational data and experimental data can be challenging because the difference in computational and experimental data is for computational data, in a sense, we have full control over how we generate it because we know the assumptions and we generate the data. With experiments, that's not always the case, right? You have maybe some unknown errors or, 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 or shifts in the data that come due, purely due to the experimental setup that, of course, are not captured in any, in, in any way in the computational uh, framework. 
Yeah, I'm sorry that we will not have more time for questions. There are six questions left that we will answer in a blog post. So you will get an answer for these questions. Thank you for your uh, interest. And Thank you to... can also write me an email. So whenever you have questions, please don't yes. hesitate to write me an email. So thank you, Peter, for a very interesting uh, talk and also conversation. And, and I would like to finish with the next slide where I invite you to the next meeting. Uh, next seminar is our first distinguished lecturer seminar of the semester. Maya Ackerman, the CEO of WebAI, and also a professor in Santa Clara University. And she will talk about a very uh, trendy topic, generative AI for creative applications, especially in music, which is not the standard thing of text that all people talk about to this day. So please register right away with the QR code or, uh, or later when you receive an email, but I look forward to see you in this talk. And thank you, Peter, again for your nice expedition. Thanks so much again for the invitation. It was a pleasure.